Although renowned for being one of the most innovative military powers in Europe, the invention of tanks caught the German Empire completely by surprise during the Great War. After witnessing the success of the early British Mark I tanks, the Kaiser's finest engineers rushed the lumbering 18-crew A7V into production, only to be upstaged by the seemingly endless swarm of tiny two-man Renault FTs unleashed by the French in 1917. Lacking the time or resources to keep up with the progress of technology, Germany had to make do with its 20 A7Vs and a few dozen captured British tanks until it was forced to surrender in 1918. But even as the ink on the Versailles Treaty was drying, forward-thinking officers of the new Weimar Republic were pondering what a new age of mechanized warfare might look like. Though banned from building tanks, owning tanks, or even looking suspiciously at foreign tanks, the new Reichswehr began a clandestine tank development program as early as the 1920s. This was enabled by the close collusion with Soviet Russia, whose dictator, Josef Stalin, saw cooperation with Germany as a necessary evil to help modernize the Red Army. Aside from giving German engineering firms valuable experience in the construction of armored vehicles, this secret program allowed military engineers to explore the concept of utilizing tanks in various different roles. During the Great War, tanks had been mostly used to break through static trench lines, using their vast bulk to tear through meters of barbed wire and ford large ditches. However, the Renault FT had also played a major role in the Hundred Days Offensive that had broken the back of the Kaiser's legions. By transporting the tiny vehicles on trucks, the French had been able to rapidly deploy them across large sections of their line, overwhelming the Germans wherever their defenses were weakest. With tanks having already demonstrated such a variety of tactical uses, the Reichswehr decided early on to specialize new designs into one of two flexible roles, engaging enemy tanks or spearheading attacks against fortified enemy positions. The initial candidates for these roles were the Leichtraktor, armed with a 3.7cm high-velocity gun intended to fire armor-piercing shells, and the Großtraktor, armed with a 7.5cm low-velocity gun designed to lob high explosive. But many commanders still clung to the idea of the tank as a land battleship, with multiple turrets of different calibers emulating the primary and secondary batteries of a naval warship. Thus, in 1932, the Heereswaffenamt, or Army Weapons Department, laid down plans for a triple turreted vehicle with a main battery consisting of a 7.5cm L24 gun, a coaxial 3.7cm KWK36 L24 gun, and a secondary battery of two machine gun turrets to deal with thin-skinned targets like infantry and unarmored vehicles. The tank had an estimated weight of 15 tons. For some idea of how absurd this was, the US M3 Stuart light tank, with its single turret, averaged around 14 tons. This new take on the land battleship concept was, like every other German armored vehicle at the time, completely and totally illegal under the Versailles Treaty. Therefore, its official designation was deliberately obscure and changed several times during development. These names included both Großtraktor Neubau and Mittlerle Traktor Neubau. The designation was finally standardized as Neubaufahrzeug, or New Construction Vehicle, by Vaproof 6 in October 1933. In addition to its designation, many other details of the tank changed throughout its design and prototyping stages. This was mainly due to Vaproof 6 awarding production contracts to two separate companies, Rheinmetall Boisig and Krupp. Both firms had their own interpretations of what the Neubaufahrzeug would look like. Of the two, Rheinmetall had more experience thanks to its prior successful work on the Großtraktor. So Krupp was stuck on turret design while its competitor worked on the complete vehicle. By 1933, both companies had completed their paper design work, and by 1935, two prototypes made from soft steel were ready for assessment. Despite a two-year lead on their competitor, Rheinmetall Boisig shot themselves in the foot with their bizarre choice of turret configuration, which stacked the 3.7cm gun directly on top of the 7.5cm gun. Krupp's design was much more conventional, placing the guns side by side, and its simplified turret more suitable for mass production. As a result, Vaproof 6 decided to combine Krupp's turret with Rheinmetall's chassis for a production run of three vehicles. This did not mean the prototypes were simply scrapped. 1935 was the same year the Reichswehr transitioned into the Wehrmacht, with Hitler officially repudiating the disarmament clause of the Versailles Treaty in March, pulling Germany's tank program out of the shadows and into the full light of day. The two prototype Nibafadzeugs were promptly turned into training vehicles, as compulsory military service was flooding the military schools with prospective tankers. 
This left the matter of the three production vehicles, which were already in a strange limbo thanks to their many design quirks. By the mid-1930s, most nations had realized that the idea of the tank as a land battleship was, at the very least, fundamentally flawed. Only Soviet Russia was still seriously pursuing the concept with production vehicles like the T-35A and T-28, and even they were starting to pivot towards single turret designs, with their final hurrah in the form of the SMK and T-100. With work on what would eventually become the Panzer III and IV already having begun in 1936, the Nebofatsoig was already on the verge of becoming obsolete. To understand why the Nebofatsoig never made it past five working vehicles, it's necessary to delve deeper into its technical specifications and many interesting design quirks. These began with the choice of engine, a BMW VA six-cylinder liquid-cooled engine providing 290 horsepower at 1400 RPM. For those unfamiliar with engine specifications, 1400 RPM gave a massive amount of torque for a vehicle whose road speed topped out at 30 km per hour. This was due to 1930s Germany lacking the industrial capacity to build a dedicated tank engine of sufficient power, forcing them to adapt an aircraft engine for the purpose. Given the, well, minor differences between tanks and planes, the Nebofadzoig was stuck with an oversized drivetrain that both increased its overall weight to 23 tons and took up extensive internal space. Even with the weight increase, the Nebofatsoig was relatively light for the kind of vehicle it was, with a length of 6.65 meters, a width of 2.9 meters, and a height of 2.9 meters, the tank was around 30 tons lighter than the later Tiger I, but of similar size. This was mostly due to the frankly pathetic armor protection, which consisted of 8 millimeters to 20 millimeter thick plates. Photographic evidence suggests the crews of the Nebofatsoig were well aware of this issue and attempted to compensate on at least one occasion by using stolen masonry bricks as improvised armor. These same photographs also demonstrate the liability posed by the thin armor plates, as one shows a small hole in the forward machine gun turret, likely caused by an anti-tank rifle. Another unique feature of the Nebofatsoig was its coil spring suspension system. Unique because it sucked and was never adopted by any other vehicle that entered full production. The placement of the rear drive sprocket was responsible for most of the issues, often causing the Nebofatsoig to throw its track during complicated maneuvers. The transmission for this unwieldy system was a ZF SSG 280 type with six gears plus reverse, accessible via a hatch mounted on a large bolted plate at the rear of the vehicle. The fact that three production vehicles ever saw actual combat duties is a testimony to just how desperate for armored vehicles the German army was at the start of World War II. Following the victory in Poland, Germany turned its attention north and began an invasion of Denmark and Norway to secure the shipping routes for its vital iron ore shipments from Sweden. The invasion of Denmark took less than a week, but the subsequent invasion of Norway necessitated a major air and amphibious operation across difficult terrain. With nearly all of Germany's tank force being reserved for the imminent campaigns against France, only a single small unit called the Panzerabteilung 40 was assigned to support infantry operations in Norway. This consisted of 29 Panzer Ones, 18 Panzer Twos, and all three production models of the Nebofatsoig. For the most part, the three tanks were used as propaganda vehicles during military parades, wowing the captive population of Norway with their huge size and apparent power. But while representing a dead end in terms of design, the Nova Fatsoig was still a fully equipped combat vehicle and did see useful service against Allied forces at Andalsnes in April of 1940. The details of these engagements are sparse, but it appears that one was blown apart in spectacular fashion by an unknown gun, probably an artillery strike or a mine. A second vehicle was photographed in damaged condition, having partially gone off-road and presumably thrown a track somewhere in the Norwegian highlands. Surprisingly enough, the two surviving Nobofatsoig apparently acquitted themselves very well during the Norway campaign. The following report was given by the commander of ZBV-40 about the vehicles. The Nobofatsoig were deployed with great success, even in the mountains. Despite warnings and many official reports, all bridges, even those with limitations of less than five tons, could be crossed without problems. Also, the tanks could move through very narrow streets, in most cases where Nurbofatsoig were sent forward, our artillery could not be deployed. The tanks, however, were able to fully compensate for the missing artillery. Effective fire was opened with the 7.5 centimeter gun, overpowering any enemy. Firing of smoke shells, only possible by the 7.5 centimeter gun of the Nurbofatsoig, was absolutely necessary to blind the enemy and impede the use of his own weapons. For this reason, the tank was essential for combat in mountainous terrain. 
From this report, it's evident that the Nubafadzoeg was best used more like a self-repelled artillery piece than a traditional tank. The 7.5cm short-barreled howitzer-style gun was ideal for anti-fortification work, and its sheer size likely had a strong physiological effect on Norwegian troops who had probably never seen tanks before. The glowing praise it received for its mobility is also quite remarkable, but may point more towards the skills of its crew than any brilliant design features. After their brief stint on the front lines, the remaining two tanks were stationed at Akershus Fortress in Oslo for the rest of 1940. After this point, the historical record becomes very fuzzy, with sources giving wildly different accounts about the final fate of the four remaining Nabafatsoig. Most agree they were sent back to training schools where they were used until their spare parts ran out. Photographs of the first prototype proved it survived until at least 1942, but it is doubtful any made it until the end of the war. Their hulls were most likely scrapped, and the steel used to produce more combat-viable tanks sometime between 1942 and 45. However, there exists a conflicting historical account by author Savodny, who claims the two surviving production tanks were part of Panzer Group 1 during Barbarossa, where they were lost during the attack on the city of Dobno, located in modern-day Ukraine. No solid evidence exists to support this claim, but it isn't beyond the realm of possibility either. When considering the final impact of the Nobofantsoig on German tank philosophy, it's wise to remember that a failed design still represents a valuable learning experience. With only five vehicles produced, the Nobofantsoig provided German military thinkers with tangible evidence that the land battleship concept was fundamentally non-viable for the type of war they were planning to wage. The three production vehicles were also valuable for training purposes, and had just enough combat potential to be used as stopgaps in small engagements where any tank is better than no tank. This concludes our look at Germany's ill-fated flirtation with the land battleship. But what are your thoughts? Would you have cancelled the project early, or did the experience Germany gained from it justify the expense? What other experimental German vehicles ought we to cover? Let us know in the comments below. Also, check out our long and highly detailed article written on the Nova Fontsoid over on the Tank Encyclopedia website. As always, keep us in your sights.